us pray. Father, we thank you that there is none like you and that you have chosen us to be your children. And we are grateful and we are thankful. And we're thankful, Lord, that we get to gather together in your house and lift up praises to your holy and righteous name. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming this morning. I want to uh, preach today from Psalm 52. Psalm chapter 52 as we talk about the thanksgiving of the righteous. The thanksgiving of the righteous. Psalm 52 is a short psalm. It's only nine verses long and we'll be looking at that this morning. Psalm 52. I'll begin reading in verse 1 and read down through verse 9. Why do, the, why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The loving kindness of God endures all day long. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking what is right. Selah. You love all words that devour, O seedful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch you up and tear you away from your tent and uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. The righteous will see in fear and will laugh at him, saying, Behold, the man who would not make God his refuge. He trusted in the abundance of his riches and was strong in his evil desire. But as for me, I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. I will give you thanks forever because you have done it. And I will wait on your name, for it is good in the presence of your godly ones. The Thanksgiving of the righteous. Have you ever had one of those terrible weeks when it just seemed like all hell had come against you. Well, if you haven't, you will, so you better listen to this message. I remember uh, Cindy and I, when we first uh, took, I was the new pastor at my first full-time church, and uh, I was at that stage in my ministry where um, I thought people were supposed to like me. And uh, uh, I found out that uh, it's nice to be liked, but it's better to be right with God. Amen. And so uh, I did something back then that I wouldn't advise anybody to do, and I wouldn't do again. But I, I was I was still green, and and uh, we had a movie store in our town back then. You you rented movies. Remember that from a store, and you had to rewind them and all that uh, back in the Stone Age and. Uh, they had a movie store, and it was right on the main highway in this small little town that we lived in, and all the school buses, when they left the school, went right beside this movie store, and they were advertising a movie, I don't remember what it was, but it was vulgar, and they had a picture that was really bad advertising this movie, and several people had mentioned it to me, and as a pastor, I thought I'd do the noble thing and call the store up, movie store, and ask politely if they would mind removing that poster because all the kids leave school and see that. And so it was a, a, a Saturday morning, and I called up and I said, uh, I told her who I was, and I said, I was just wondering if you'd be so kind to consider taking down that, that poster. And the woman on the other end of the telephone gave me a response that I wasn't expecting. She said, my kids don't use drugs. I said, yes, ma'am, I know that. And that's not why I called. I was calling. And then she just had a meltdown on the other end of the phone and just crying and carrying on. And I said, well, I'm sorry, ma'am. I just thought I'd ask. And so uh, uh, that, that, that was a strange encounter. Well, just to, just to find, finish it up, I noticed that Saturday night we had a singing. Now, if you're not from the South, you don't know what that is. Because it's not really a singing, it's a singing. And uh, uh, you, you leave heaven to come to a singing. I mean, it's just uh, something you do. And we had this group coming from Jackson, Tennessee, over 150 miles away. They had been booked for like two months and they roll up in a big old bus and got out. And I noticed the lead singer was mad at me. 
I had no idea. I never met the guy. I didn't know who he was. He got out. They went through their singing. As soon as the concert was over and everything, these guys began to change clothes. And uh, I was uh, there waiting on him to leave. I was going to lock up the church. He said, I'd like to have a word with you, Pastor. And I said, okay. He takes me off in the corner, and he begins to chew me out. He says, I can't believe you did to my mother-in-law what you did. I said, what are you talking about? Turns out the woman who owns the movie store was his (laughs) mother-in-law. And by the end of the day, everybody in the church was mad at me (laughs) for treating the woman at the movie store ugly. I promise you I didn't treat her ugly. (laughs) And I'm telling you that story because at the end of that day and by the time Sunday had been over the next day, I felt like all the forces of hell had been unleashed on me because of the ugly gossip and things that had been saying. And, and, and so sometimes that's the way we feel when we're in ministry. And I'm here to tell you this morning that that's the way David felt, felt when he wrote this psalm. Let, let me just give you a few things about this psalm. Uh, first off, this psalm is called a maskil, M-A-S-K-I-L. A maskil is a song that is to be sung with skill. In other words, it's to be practiced. Not only that, but a maskil is a song that is a contemplation song. In other words, it's not something, it's not a ditty. This is one that's got deep thought. You're supposed to really think about it. That's why it has the word selah in there. The word selah is a musical interlude. When you read that, it really means think about that. And so two times in this psalm, you have a pause, and the writer says, now just think about that. It's a maskil, and a maskil uh, was also a didactic psalm, psalm, which means basically it was used for instruction. So this is a very deep psalm that is used by the psalmist to teach us something about giving thanks when all hell breaks loose. It's a psalm of David, and uh, I want you to notice how it is. It's, it's basically two parts. First part is the, uh, is the boastings of the wicked, and that's in verses 1 through 6. And then the second part is the confessions of the righteous, and that's in verses 7 through 9. And so we're going to look at this in just a minute, but let me give you just a little more background information. Psalm 52 is a psalm of David. Historically, this psalm was composed by David after the horrible events that happened while he was on the run from a crazy king named King Saul. King Saul had become paranoid and began to chase David. David was in the wilderness on the run. David came to a small priestly village that was called Nob, N-O-B. We've been studying this on Wednesday night, by the way. And David came to this little priestly village called Nob, and uh, what he needs is two things. He needs some food, and he needs some, a sword. And so he asked the priest for some food, and the priest said, all I've got is consecrated bread. And so it wasn't really lawful uh, to eat that, but because it was such an emergency, he gave him that bread. And then David said, do, do, is there a sword here anywhere? And we don't know how the sword got there, but the only sword they had was the sword of Goliath, the giant that David had slew before. And so uh, the priest gives David some bread. He gives David uh, 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 the sword of Goliath. And uh, the Bible says that in this story, in 1 Samuel 21, it says, verse 7, and now the servant of Saul was there, a servant of Saul was there that day. Now understand, David's running from Saul. And it says there was a servant of Saul there that day. His name was, now get this name, Dueg the Edomite. Now he sounds like something on Star Wars or something, man. He's he's a villain. Dueg the Edomite, he was one of Saul's chief shepherds. Now, we can't say for certain why he was there. He may have been a, a captive of King Saul, but... Many scholars believe that because he was an Edomite and not a Jew, 
that he had actually defected from his own people and was there as a traitor serving under King Saul. And that fits his personality. And this Doeg the Edomite goes back and he tells King Saul, David is over there at Nob. Go down there and get him. And when Saul arrives at Nob, David was already gone. And so what he does is King Saul orders the extermination of everybody in the village. Man, woman, boy, girl, even the children and the cattle. The men of Israel say we can't do that because we can't slay a priest of God. And so Dueg the Edomite says, don't worry, David, I'll do it. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel twenty two nineteen, 19, he struck Nob, the city of the priest, with the edge of the sword, both man and woman, children and infant, oxen, donkey, and sheep, he struck with the edge of the sword. Now there was one priest that got away. His name was Abathar. Abathar went and told David what had happened. Now here's David gets the news and this is his heart when he writes Psalm 52. David said to Abathar, I knew on that day when Dueg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. Now listen, I, David, I have brought about the death of every person in your father's household. David says, he went down there and killed everybody because he's mad at me. Can you imagine how he must have felt? All those people, all those children, all that livestock needlessly killed because of the wicked twosome of Dueg the Edomite and crazy King Saul. When I say all hell came against David, I'm not using that just as a figure of speech. I'm not being slang. I'm not being crude. I'm telling you that all the forces of hell had come against David because it's from the line of David that ultimately a virgin Mary would conceive of the Holy Spirit and give birth to the royal son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Satan is doing everything he can to stop it. And David composes this mascal to instruct the people of God on how to be thankful when all hell breaks out. So the tr central truth this morning is the righteous always have reason to be thankful. We always have reason to be thankful. First thing I want to do is look at the first part. See the boasting of the wicked, verses one through five. Why do the, boast, uh, the, the wicked boast? Well, number one, the wicked boast in evil. They boast in evil. The psalmist said in verse one, why are you boasting in evil? Isn't that a deep question? How come there are certain people in this world that enjoy doing wickedness? I mean, they're not just uh, guys who slip every once in a while. They're not just people who make mistakes. They're people who plan and, and participate and brag about how wicked they are. The psalmist said in Psalm 10, 3, the wicked boast of his heart's desire. In Psalm 93, it says, how long shall the wicked, O Lord, how long shall the wicked exalt? They pour forth words. They speak arrogantly. All the wicked vaunt themselves. They're proud of their wickedness. I don't know about you, but I feel frustrated. I feel frustrated when I see Injustice and wickedness parading itself around like it's some sort of righteousness. We see it all the time. We see today the media is saturated with people who are boasting about their sin, boasting about their wickedness. The sexually deviant today are put on a pedestal like there's somebody to be proud of. We see this all the time, folks, it's not right. Uh, the crooked politicians are on every party and, and they boast about their own wicked. You know, we had an election last week and you know what? In one of the states, I can't remember which one, on the ballot, it said, should medical attention be withheld from babies that are born alive? 
60% of that state said, yeah, you ought to withhold medical attention, let them die. And then as soon as that initiative, that wicked, murderous initiative passed by a majority of the people, some wicked, boastful politician strode out to a, a microphone and said, today we have seen a great victory for the right to choose. Boasting in their own wickedness. The second thing, they boast in deceit. The psalmist tells us how the wicked boast and carry out their wickedness. They use deceit. They lie. They slander. They twist the truth. Notice he writes in verse 1, they boast in evil. It says their tongue, uh, 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 verse, verse 2, it says your tongue devises destruction. They love falsehood more than speaking what is right, according to verse 3. They love all words that devour, according to verse 4. They like to talk about wicked stuff. Their main tool of the wicked is their tongue. It's their tongue. It's their communication. It's their press. It's their communication. They spread lies and they spread half-truths. By the way, a half-truth is a whole lie. Amen? Amen. And so the wicked have no problem the wicked have no problem assassinating somebody's character. They don't mind that at all. As a matter of fact, James says about the tongue and how vile it can be. He says the tongue is a fire, a very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and it is set on fire of hell. And then James says in James 3, 8, no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. The wicked tongue. The wicked don't care about the truth. And here's something. If you ever get involved in, in any kind of conflict or, or any kind of uh, uh, activity with the wicked, they won't play by the rules of the righteous. Righteous people tell the truth. Righteous people don't go after somebody's character. Righteous people uh, try to speak truth, but the wicked don't care. They'll lie about you. They'll, they'll do it. That's what David's talking about here. And Dueg the Edomite had went and shared that information that he had with King Saul, and now they had come. I remember back when that was going on uh, that I told you about, and uh, everybody was upset at church. There was a woman in that church, and she loved to gossip. And I'm not telling you anything she wouldn't tell you. She'd tell, she tell you, I love gossip. As a matter of fact, uh, she was an elderly woman, and uh, Cindy can testify, you know, I'm not telling a lie. Cindy says so. And uh, uh, she used to go down to the city hall every Monday morning because she would gather up all the gossip she could learn at church, and she'd walk in the city hall, and this is what she would announce when she'd walk in. She'd say, this may not be true, but it sure is fun to tell. <laughs> Stole everything she knew. And so I just ask you this morning, who has not felt the sting and the anger of untrue false accusations? The wicked. They gossip, passing on information about other people that hurts their character, and their favorite tool is their tongue. David must have felt awful when he learned that Dueg the Edomite had went down there and shared that information with King Saul, and then King Saul in turn came and wiped out the entire village. It's difficult to be thankful when you're on the receiving end of a destructive tongue. When gossip flourishes against the church and the people of God. But David, he, he throws out a lifeline to us. And notice what he says. He says, the wicked boast in futility. Not only do they boast in their wickedness and boast in deceit, but their boast is futile. It's a waste of time. Notice what David says in verse 5. David says, but God will break you down forever. Now, we'll just stop right there for a minute. Aren't you thankful that there are some but gods in the Bible? 
You know, but God means that everything would go like you think it's going to or like the wicked think it's going to. But God. Let, let, me, let me read you another but God in the Bible. Let me read this. In Ephesians chapter 2, listen to this, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He's not painting a good picture of us. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That was our condition. That's where we were. That's how we are before God comes into our life. The next two words change everything. But God, hallelujah, but God, but God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up with him and seated, uh, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I thank God for the but God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord that he intervenes on behalf of his children. Would not we all be slain by the captive of of sin, the devil, if God had not intervened with his marvelous, matchless, amazing grace and through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that when we have faith in him, all of our past is washed away and all of our future is bright and sunny. Praise God, we've got reason to be thankful this morning. Amen. Here David says, the wicked with their lying tongues seem to prevail. It looks like, I mean, it's a bad situation over there at Nob. But God, what does David say God will do? Notice in verse 5, God will break you down forever, O wicked tongue. Forever means what? Forever means they're going to go to hell. That's what it means. It means they're going to go to hell. Listen, it may look like today that the wicked is, is ruling this world and they're going to win. It's like the silly bumper sticker we see. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. I'm here to tell you, whoever dies with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's who wins. Amen. Amen. According to the word of God. He says, forever. Break them down forever. Snatch them up and tear them away. What is that? That's a picture of total devastation. The wicked seem unmovable and unbeatable, but God will uproot them from the land of the living. So I ask you, what do the wicked have to boast about? Well, they boast about their wickedness, but how much boasting are they going to do in hell? What good would it do for somebody to be bragging about how wicked they were for eternity in a devil's hell? Beloved, there is a God. There is one true and living God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. David was constantly worried about how the wicked seemed to prevail. In Psalm 73, he asked this question. He said, they say, the wicked say, how does God know? And, there, and is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I've kept myself pure and washed my hands in innocence. For I've been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. David says, what's up with this, God? It seems like us righteous people are always getting the short end of the stick. It was perplexing to David. And then David pondered it and he wrote one verse later. Listen to what he says. When I ponder to understand this, why do the wicked perish? Uh, uh, why do the wicked prosper? When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. Listen, until I came into the house of God, David said, "You get in the house of God, you get in God's presence, and all of a sudden perspective changes. Then I perceive their end. Surely you set them in a slippery place." You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away in sudden terrors. 
Today, this morning, I would just ask you to contemplate, to think about that. Where is Dueg the Edomite? I can tell you where he's at. I can tell you where he's been for thousands of years, and I'll tell you where he'll remain for all of eternity. He will remain the subject of God's eternal wrath for all of eternity. You see, God's word is sure, and God's justice will prevail. Listen to this. Once a, uh, uh, there was an agnostic farmer. He wrote to the editor of a local paper who was a devout Christian. In his defiance, he said, I, I plowed my fields on Sunday. I dissed my fields and I fertilized them on Sunday. I planted them on Sunday. I cultivated them on Sunday. And I reaped them on Sunday. This October, I had the biggest crop I ever had. How do you explain that? And the editor simply replied, God does not always settle his accounts in October. <laughs> Amen? God will deal with the boastful wicked. But now notice the second part, and that's the confession of the righteous in verses 6 through 9. Notice it says in verse 6, the righteous will see in fear and will laugh at him. Laugh at this wicked guy. Now, the righteous confess their satisfaction. Now, why do I use the word satisfaction? Because that's what the laughing is about. The laughing is not about something that's funny, but it's kind of like, uh, uh, it's kinda like when, I, when I was a kid, we had a teacher in school, and she kept uh, correcting us, and my buddy, he just kept uh, messing up, and finally, that teacher stomped back there, and she grabbed him and just ripped him out of the desk and just whooped him in a circle. Did you ever see that happen? Just go around in a circle whooping the kid? Well, she did, and then she stuck him back in that desk, and I saw when she walked back to her desk, she had a smirk of satisfaction on her face. <laughs> and you see, that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about the righteous see what's happened to the, uh, the righteous see what happens, what God does to the wicked, or believes that eventually God will do this to the wicked, and it brings a certain satisfaction to our heart, a chuckle. Now, Today in our culture, we seem to be really trying to get a lot of justice. And justice is great if we can get it. We hear about reparations, reparations. Going back in the past and finding people that had been done wrong by somebody else and paying them money to restore. Now, I don't, don't doubt that people who want that may have some good motives. But do you know that every wrong in the past cannot be made right in this world? It can't, be, it can't be made right in this world. And so I understand people want to see the books balanced, but you may have to wait till eternity to see the books balanced. I hear about, uh, I talked to a man one day, he said that he didn't want to believe in God because he saw the Nazi gas chambers. He said, any God that allow that, I won't believe in him. I'm here to tell you all those Nazis that persecuted all those people, they may have gotten away with it in this world, but they'll stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and one of these days they will give an account of their life, and when the righteous look on, we will laugh. We'll have a sense of satisfaction because of the holy justice of God Almighty. Now, there are two ways that God expels his wrath on the wicked. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died there as a substitute to pay for all of our sins. That means the wrath of God was put upon Jesus so that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will have faith in the finished work of Christ, the substitutionary death of Jesus on our behalf, and we're willing to repent and turn our lives over and follow Jesus the Bible says all of our sins, all of the wrath that we deserve would be put upon Jesus. But those who reject Christ, they have no covering. They have no other, uh, they have no substitute. They'll receive the eternal wrath of God in their own selves. There was a wicked old king who had a jester. Wicked old king had a jester. 
And he gave his scepter to the jester. And he said this. He said to this jester, when you find a bigger fool than yourself, give him this scepter. And so for years uh, uh, passed and the king was on his deathbed. And he called uh, his court together. And he said to them, I'm about to go on a long journey. And I will not return. And so... uh, Uh, The jester reminded him, said, Sir, King, have you made preparations for this long journey? Have you prepared to meet God? And the king said to the jester, No, I haven't. At that point, the jester laid the scepter on the king's breast. He found a bigger fool than himself because only a fool would take the wrath of God instead of uh, allowing Jesus to take the wrath that he deserves. The writer says in Psalm 52 and verse 7, he says, Behold the man who would not make God his refuge. Now, when it says, Behold the man, we'd say it like this. Look at this guy. Check him out, man. Look at this guy. He would not make God his refuge. In other words, he, instead of having faith in God, he wants to take the wrath of God himself. Why? Because he doesn't believe in God's justice. But the righteous should be thankful that through the precious substitutional blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of our sins and all of our transgressions have been paid in full. And we can thank God for that because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. For all the others who refuse to allow Christ to be their substitute would not take, make God their refuge. They have no hope. So the righteous confess their satisfaction because of the justice of God. The second thing is the righteous confess their stability. Their stability. Notice how David, David describes the righteous. In verse 8 he says they are green olive trees in the house of God. The olive tree in the Bible represents life and prosperity. But notice the olive tree is planted. It's planted in the house of God. Planted in the house of God. Now what David is doing here is he's contrasting the wicked with the righteous. The righteous man is an olive tree planted in the house of God. What about the wicked? What's he in? Well, he's in a tent that's about to be snatched up by God. He ain't got a prayer. And so David says, uh, the righteous is like an olive tree planted in the house of God. But notice something else. He uses the term house of God in this psalm. Now, you Bible historians know that the temple, the house of God, was not built even in David's lifetime. The temple was built by Solomon after David was dead. Therefore, when he uses the house of God here, he's not talking about architecture. He's talking about family. He's talking about our spiritual position as people of faith being grounded and stable, planted like olive trees in the house of God. When is the last time you thought about it and actually gave God thanks for adopting you into his family? Praise God. Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says, So you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. We have a personal relationship with God Almighty. We who were once hell-bound sinners by grace of our loving Heavenly Father have been transformed and born of the Spirit and we've been translated from darkness into light and as children of God, we are bound for glory and eternal bliss and it's all because that uh, Jesus died for us. We get to go to heaven not because of what we did but because of what He did. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the easiest falling off a turnip truck. I, I couldn't make salvation any easier. 
And so when we, when we confess that he saves, that settles it. The righteous confess their satisfaction in God's justice, and the righteous confess their stability in God's salvation. And then third, I want you to see the righteous confess their certainty. Their certainty. Notice what he says in verse 9. And I will wait on your name, for it is good. Modern Americans don't associate names like they did in the Bible. In the Bible, names often described a person's character. God reveals his name. That's why, that, because God reveals his name, think about this, we ought not assign names to God that God has not revealed himself as. You see, God tells us who he is through his name. That means we don't have the right to call him the man upstairs. You don't, you don't get to call him that. First off, he's not upstairs. And second off, he's not a man. So God reveals himself through his name. And so the name of God is holy because the name of God is who God is. And that's why it is such a sin to take the Lord's name in vain. The Bible says in Psalms 139, thy enemies take thy name in vain, O Lord. And when the psalmist says in verse 9, I will wait on your name for it is good, he is confessing that his hope is in the certain sovereign control of God's loving character. He's saying, I can depend on you, God, because you're faithful. God, God is, one of his names is faithful. I can depend on you, God, because you're good. I can depend on you, God, because you're holy. I can depend on you, God, because you're mighty. I can depend on God because you have revealed yourself to me as your adopted son, and I am certain that I am saved because I am a person who believes in you. He says, your character is good, notice this, in the presence of your godly ones. That's another way of saying, God, everybody in the church knows that you keep your word. Everybody in the church knows that your character is impeccable. The writer of Hebrews says that we have hope and that uh, our hope is in God because it's impossible for him to lie. He says we have strong encouragement to take hope of that hope that is set before us. This hope, he says, is both sure and steadfast because we're anchored to the Lord Jesus Christ who entered into the presence of God and purchased our redemption and we couldn't be any more saved if we were kicking up gold dust on the, on the streets of gold. I'm telling you right now, did you ever stop and think about this? You are just as saved today. If you're saved, you're just as saved as you will be for a gazillion years from now. That ain't never going to change. God's people got a reason to be excited about the future. Stop worrying about the stock market and stop thinking about heaven. Hallelujah. Wow. Y'all got to help me this morning. I want to point out that even though all hell had broke loose against David, he made a decision. Do you ever get up in the morning and make a decision to be grumpy? I know some of y'all have. I've never done that, but I've known people who have. You know, you can decide your mood a lot of times. You can decide whether you want to be thankful or whether you just want to complain. David said, I will thank you forever because you have done it. I, I studied that little phrase right there for a long time. And as I studied the life of David in relation to this psalm, when David wrote Psalm 52, David's greatest days were still ahead. He wrote this while he was on the run. He was on the run in the wilderness for 10 years from King Saul. 
God had already told him he was going to be the king. Samuel had already anointed him as the next king. But Saul was breathing down murder. And Doeg, the Edomite, was slaughtering people because they were hiding David. And David was in the wilderness. And David said, I will give you thanks forever because you have done it. Because you've done it. What David is doing is he is praising God for the victory he is yet to see. David's greatest days were still on the horizon, but he knows that even if all hell is breaking loose, I know a God. I know the God. My God and my Father is going to get me through. He says, and I will wait on your name for it is good in the presence of your God. See, David was a man of faith. David was a man of faith. Old Billy Sunday used to say he was so sure that he was going to heaven that he would swing across hell holding on to a spider web. <laughs> well, one of these days, one of these days, we're going we're, we're gonna to look around at each other. What do you think we're going to be doing 150 years from now? You ain't going to be here. 150 years from now, you and I are going to look back on this this thing and we're going to say, that day at Southern Calvert Baptist Church, all hell was coming against me, but I was able to say, thank God, for he has done it. Nancy DeMoss, Christian writer, many of you, me with her writings. She says that the importance of gratitude can hardly be overstated. I've come to believe that few things are more becoming in a child of God than a grateful spirit. By the same token, there is probably nothing that makes a person more unattractive than the absence of a grateful spirit. I have learned that in every circumstance that comes my way, I can choose to respond in one of two ways. I can whine or I can worship. David chose to worship. What about you this morning? Are you a person of faith? Do you know that God has your life in the palm of his hand and nothing can come to you that God doesn't approve of? Are you a person of faith? Listen, we have reason to give thanks. When all hell breaks loose, the righteous can thank God for his justice. When all hell breaks loose, the righteous can thank God for the stability of his salvation. And when all hell breaks loose, the righteous thank God for the certainty of his character to fulfill his promises. Would you stand with me this morning, bow your head, close your eyes. With every head bowed and every eye closed, our musicians are on their way. We offer an invitation. The psalmist said, Selah. Think about that. Think about that. Do you need to receive Christ this morning as your Savior? Right where you stand. See, I can't receive Christ for you. Neither can anybody else. Your parents can't. It's a personal act of your will to say, yes, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior and Lord. I believe you died on Calvary's cross as my substitute. Today I turn away from my sinful living as best I can. And I give my heart to you. If you if you said that prayer just now, if that's the if that's the desire of your heart, then praise God. You just became a child of God. You just got adopted into the family of God. Your, your, your eternity is certain. And the wrath of God would not come upon you because Jesus paid it all. And so this morning, if you if you pray to receive Christ, maybe you want to share that. Come up here. We've got a couple of pastors up here, some deacons. I'll be up here. 
We'll pray with you. We just want to help you get started in your Christian walk. And then maybe this morning, you just want to pray. Maybe this is a week and all hell has come against you. And you just need to come up here and and get on your knees before God and say, God, I need your help. Help me, Lord Jesus. And maybe you want to join Southern Calvary Baptist Church or you got somebody you want to pray for. I'm going to pray. And if you feel led to respond to God's invitation, you're not coming to me. You're not coming to any of these pastors. We'll help you. We'll help you. But you're coming up here to meet with God. Dear Father, we pray. Pray that you use this sermon, Lord, some way, somehow, some soul that needs to be encouraged. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.